there's a whole process of vetting the sources and understanding if they're valid for you. There's a whole data modeling exercise. And I, I would say like when we think about data-driven innovation and really data-driven product development, that's key. Like understanding what is the core data model, what's in there, what you might use it for, what's wrong with it, how it goes wrong and awry and what you have to do to keep it clean. That is like the fundamental starting point for a lot of these projects to be able to make sure that you're successful at the other side. If you understand the data model, you can nail the rest of it. When when should a company come to you? Like, and I assume not right when they start up or not when they're dying or not when they're... So uh, when would be like the perfect time? There are two two kind of funny answers to that question. Like when, when do they come to us and when should they come to us? Um, yes, that's always, that's always yeah. the thing with services. <laughs> so I think some of our key differentiators are, are that we are a partner. We really, to, a, to a, every single employee, we, we all rally around this concept of business value. And when we're looking at a project for a customer, we really think about, okay, what is, your, what is the business value we're creating here? If you're writing code and creating data pipelines and creating analytics, you have to know where to cheat. Some things are a commodity and don't matter and they don't create value. And some things are really important and create value in a number of different ways. And when you're gonna spend somebody's innovation budget, you we, we like to say that you have three critical resources. You have time, you have political air support for the innovation project to do something new or different, and you have money. And uh, there, there's this action potential, this, this you know, gate you have to get through with delivering innovative stuff. And if you don't get through that gate, the innovation dies. And uh, we, we call it like, when we think about like a quanta of innovation, we call it D3IP. It's gotta be differentiated, it's gotta be defensible, and it's gotta be delivered. And so if you run out of time, or you run out of budget, or you run out of political air support to deliver the thing, or you run out of money, run a market window opportunity, whatever it is, um, it's not delivered. And so then it doesn't count. And if you don't reach that next kind of Mario Kart finish line on time trials, like you don't get to go another lap. And you know, the, the, the key practices at Elephant, we've, we've matured all these things over the years into this methodology we call dependable innovation. In fact, dependability is at the top of our corporate value pyramid. How do you think about that innovation process of kind of taking those three core resources and expending them carefully to make sure you produce enough defensible and differentiated IP that you can actually capture some market share or get to the next level of funding to be able to move your innovation forward. And so when, when customers come to us, they're at all phases of that life cycle. At times they will come to us far too late and they're, you know, there's no money left. There's no time left. People are upset. There's no political air support. It is very difficult in that environment uh, when you're all well, three tanks are dry to do anything. You, you know, at some time, maybe that's our advice is maybe you should prepare your resume. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there's a funny uh, old like MBA kind of CEO leader, whatever joke. It's like the three envelopes joke. It's like the, the old CEO gives the new guy three envelopes. And he said, you know, when you're in trouble, like open an envelope in order. And so like the first envelope is like announce a restructuring. The second one is like announce uh, like a rebranding and like the CEO gets in trouble the third time. The third envelope says make three envelopes. <laughs> For the next guy. Yeah. Wow. But it, anyway, so yeah. um, people typically come to us when uh, they have a challenge or a strategic shift and there's a gap between what they can very comfortably achieve internally and what they need to achieve to bridge that gap, whether it's a gap in technical understanding, uh, a, a shift in the underlying functionality of their industry, whether it's regulatory or you know, product market fit changes or something, um, or sometimes there's a disruption threat and they're trying to rally a response to that. That's, that, that often happens. Um, the, the, I think the more in innovation mojo mature organizations come to us just on a regular cadence. They have a mature innovation program. They dedicate funding outside of normal kind of operations to driving innovation and capturing new markets. And they just have a recurring pipeline of ideas and strategies and ways that they mature that. And they come to us for 
kind of outside in consulting points of view and really acceleration to say, how can we take this strategic objective, move it rapidly along uh, and get it to a place where we have actionable outputs or materialized products. Uh, sometimes it's a capacity question. Um, and and we, we love getting in as early as possible because if, if you know, we're, we're not butts in seats technologists. We are a partner on your innovation journey. We are product development ninjas. We are startup whisperers. Like we want to think about, okay, what's the business value I'm trying to create here? And if we understand what we call your prioritization framework of, of how you're going to capture business value, we know how to make decisions. And then we set up a roadmap that says, okay, in light of your prioritized business value objectives, here's the things we should go do. And then we go do them. Um, and so people come to us at all, at all sets of that, you know, all, all stages of that life cycle. We really like to get in early. Uh, we have this cool practice uh, that we learned from Google Ventures. It's the design sprint process. They have this thing called the sprint book, which is awesome. Um, but it's a really great way in kind of nine calendar days, five days in a, in a virtual room together um, to go from early phase ideation to a believable facsimile of a prototype of a thing that you test with actual users. And then you kind of synthesize that feedback, create a roadmap and say, okay, roughly thumbs up or thumbs down, you know, maybe one in five, we actually give it a thumbs down and say, you should not do this. This is a terrible idea. Um, but in that kind of nine calendar day, two days of prep, five days of doing it and two days of synthesis, you can get an actionable roadmap that says, here's the core value. Here's the validation of your assumptions. Here's the roadmap to, per, you know, to pursue this thing. And here's the rough timing and budgets. And, uh, those are a lot of fun. And we, we actually were challenged recently because of COVID. Uh, back in March, we went fully remote. We gave up all of our offices in the US and the Philippines. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, we said, okay, let's retrofit this whole design sprint process. Let's figure out how to do it remotely. We've done a pile of them remotely pretty successfully. And it's been really, really fun to see how do you, how do you create the, you know, the, the comparative experience that is in the room with posties all over the walls to people in their, you know, in their bedroom, uh, questionably wearing pants, uh, putting post-its on the walls virtually for them. Yeah. Don't stand up. <laughs> <laughs> You're in your safety zone. Please stay there. <laughs> it's nice here. I read an article that said, uh, it is a cool article, uh, that basically talked about how like, you know, preserving your silly is, uh, it is uh, critical to innovative capabilities. So by rights, uh, if we measure by silliness, our company is absolutely the most innovative company I've ever stumbled across. I, 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 tell, I tell our clients that uh, uh, my sense of humor, unfortunately, is not optional, but fortunately, it is free.